start with what is the substation. The substation is a part of a power system. You see, a power system is a network which connects various sources of power or various generating sources with loads. And a network has various nodes and each of these nodes is called a substation. So a substation is a node in a power network. Node is a place where uh, various uh, uh, circuits get connected. Now, uh, let's say you have a generating station that is connected to a node. Then you have various lines. This is the network itself. There may be a crisscrossing of different lines and a number of nodes. A node is where actually either you connect a node or you connect a generating station or sometimes both. So the entire interconnection takes place through the substations. So substation is an important component of the network itself. But of course, <coughs> they are not separate entities in themselves in the sense that they cannot exist all alone. So they basically they form a part of the network and you have to consider them in that context of the network in which they operate. The substation is a part of the network and it is a node of the network. So that means in a, a substation you get connections from different parts of the network and some uh, may also feed one or more loads. So this is what a substation is and there are different, okay. Now what is a network? Network as I said connects power generation facilities and power consumers. Generation is basically located depending on various considerations like availability of fuel, availability of water, most of the generating stations <coughs> which uh, use uh, fuels for combustion, they require water for cooling. Hydraulic power stations of course operate on water. So availability of water is one of the primary requirements for setting up a uh, power generating station. Then another consideration for siting of power station or power generating stations is about pollution because most of the processes by which you generate power, they essentially cause pollution, pollution of environment. Also, some of the generating plants like uh, uh, nuclear, they are uh, inherently unsafe, but they have dangers. So because of all this, the generating stations are located well away from the population centers, whereas the loads or the consumers are present in the population centers. So generally, generating stations are far away from the centers, the roads are the population centers. So you need to take the power from the generating facility to the consumers. So that is why a network is necessary. So basically connects different power generation facilities to power consumers. Okay, you can ask one question as to why at all you have a network. Okay, let's have generation and then connect it to a load. Okay, maybe okay, the road is not near, it is far away because generation has to take place in essentially areas where there are not so many people, not population centers, whereas the loads are population centers. So you can still connect like this. So why at all have a network and why connect different points of generation between themselves and to the loads it is because when you have a generating facility, you need to ensure that the loads are always fed. So if you have a generation facility and there is a failure, then still the load needs to be maintained. So in order to make it possible, you should have multiple generators or multiple generation facilities so that you have enough spare capacity available. So that becomes very uneconomical. That means if you have standalone systems or what you call as islands of power stations, each feeding a load, but there's no interconnection between themselves, you'll have to pro provide excess capacity to ensure proper redundancy. 
when you have a network of uh, network with different generating stations and loads connected to each other, you don't have to have a redundant generator for in every case. That means you have some amount of redundant capacity over the entire system, not individually allocated to any particular generating facility. So thereby what you can do is to share the excess capacity between several generation facilities, thereby reducing the capital costs. So one of the main ideas of the network is to be able to share uh, various, uh, I mean share a reserve among various facilities. And another uh, consideration is that often you have areas where you can produce a lot of power but there is more demand locally. So you need to be able to transfer power between one, uh, let's say, a state of a country to another state, which may be far away, where there is a shortage of power, but the generating sources are not so many there. I mean, the area is not conducive to generation. So in those cases, bulk transfer of power is also necessary. So when you have a network, the transfer of power is also possible. Over long distances, you need to transfer power. So this is another reason why actually we need to connect. So networks are necessary because multiple interconnections between generation and consumers are provided. So you have redundancy. So even uh, you, you have a network with a number of transmission lines. If one line fails, there is always another line. May not be a direct path, but still power can flow through an indirect path. So failures, whether uh, of generating stations or transmission infrastructure, a failure can always be managed by finding some alternatives, alternative transmission circuits, alternative generation, alternative transformer sometimes. So that's why a lot of uh, uh, reliability is provided. And as I said, the reserve capacity is well utilized by sharing it. So any generator anywhere, if it fails, you have some other reserve present somewhere else in the system and because of that you are able to supply the load. And, and another thing which I mentioned is transferring of power from surplus areas to deficit areas through the network. And these are all reasons why actually networks have to be provided and as I said in the beginning, a substation is an important part of a network. So this shows an overview of a network starting from the power plant, a step up transformer and transmission lines, and then step down for distribution and goes to the end user. So always actually uh, generating plants are connected to a transmission system using step up transformer. This is because generation always takes place as a, at a lower voltage. Uh, can you tell me uh, what will be the normal or maximum voltage you will possibly get from a generator? What is the rating, generator rating, the, the maximum possible voltage which you may get to in any, any type of generator? 400 kV is in the transmission system. No, no. 275, 400, they are all in the transmission. I am talking about a generator. What will be the maximum voltage of a generator? Even a large generator, maybe 500 megawatts or sometimes 1000. Any idea? Even the largest generators never exceed 25 kV as the output. And the output of the generator, the voltage will be about 25 kV. And beyond that, the insulation of the generator becomes more difficult. We cannot have, uh, uh, I mean, the insulation thickness becomes very heavy. So you can't have generators of very high voltage. So 25 kV is about the limit, but uh, smaller generators like 100 megawatt may even have lower voltages like 15 kV and all that. So these need to be connected. The transmission, of course, has to be done at high voltage. So you need uh, to step up. So why is transmission voltage kept so high? I mentioned that 400 kV and 275 kV. What is the need to make it high? What is the benefit? 
Yeah, you are right, Alberto. Reducing the losses, higher the voltage, the current will be smaller, loss will be reduced. Apart from the loss, there are also other considerations. For example, yeah, transmission conductors are made small because of the current, uh, thereby basically the cost of the transmission is reduced. So, for a given distance and for a given amount of power, mathematically you can establish what is the optimum uh, size or what is the optimum transmission voltage. Uh, because uh, when the current is less, naturally the conductors are small. So because the voltage is high, insulation or insulators uh, have to be of larger uh, voltage capacity. So, there is a trade off. But ultimately, there are actually optimum high voltage, I mean optimum voltages at which power uh, is to be distributed. And depending on the amount of power to be transmitted and also the uh, distance involved, you can calculate what is the optimum. But as you come down into the distribution network, the distances become smaller uh, and also the amount of power handled in different sections of distribution is less and therefore the voltage can be lower. And when you come to the lowest voltage of consumption, which is 400 volts 3 case, uh, you cannot distribute over very long distances nor the amount of power required to be distributed is high. So naturally, small, smaller voltages like 400 volts are quite possible. So that's why you have multiple voltages in any system. So if you see substations, which is our topic, there are a number of types of substations. Those which are close to a generating station will be generation substations, where the generators are directly connected to transformer for stepping up and transmitting. So this is a typical substation attached to the generating facility. Then you have transmission substations which are placed in the transmission network. Uh, that means a uh, line doesn't go from point A to point B if the distance is very high. Somewhere else in between you have a substation where one side you receive the voltage and then you send it to the other circuits. Sometimes number of transmission lines actually come and meet at a point. So that also is a transmission substation. Then the population centers like large cities they receive power from the transmission system, maybe not just one line, but several lines may come uh, depending on the requirement of power. So you may have a large number of lines and sometimes a different voltages also. So they are all received at one point before the distribution to the population or to the consumers is done. These are usually called as receiving substations or terminal substations. Terminal substations is where the transmission um, gets terminated, transmission circuits get terminated and then you have the distribution system on the other side or sometimes also called a sub transmission system which is a lower level uh, of transmission, smaller distances. So generally terminal substations may feed to sub transmission or sometimes distribution also. Distribution or uh, sub transmission substations where you have a city and different parts of the city, uh, you have the uh, sub transmission or zone substations, so different zones. So they are all connected to a terminal substation, get supply from that and then distribute. So distribution is done through various distribution substations, usually medium voltage, uh, 11 or 33 kV and they distribute to various other loads. Large industrial consumers whose power requirements may be in hundreds of megawatts are usually directly connected into a transmission network. They act like a terminal substation in themselves because a large quantity of power has to flow. So they have a substation uh, owned by the industry itself but of much larger capacity. So this is a special case of a consumer owned substation but otherwise distribution substations are usually owned by the utilities and they power, they uh, supply power to smaller consumers. There are special cases like uh, high voltage DC transmission systems. So there the AC supply is converted to DC and then connected to DC systems. 
Leaky systems are not very common. They are there for specific applications. Um, mainly because a long transmission line uh, creates a lot of reactive power because uh, of the uh, length and sometimes this may cause voltage issues. In order to avoid this, uh, sometimes you go for DC. Sometimes you allow different parts of the system to operate asynchronous. That means they can be at their own frequency. But you still want them to transfer power. So in that case, you can go for HVDC. Uh, sometimes you want to feed islands, large islands from the mainland. And uh, they have to be done by submarine cables. And submarine cables, uh, again being high voltage cables, if you want to feed AC through them, the amount of capacitive current becomes very, very high. This is not feasible. So there basically you need to go in for a high voltage DC link. So often large islands or offshore facilities can be fed by high voltage DC. And where you want to tie two different networks operating at their own frequencies, sometimes you want to tie two systems, one operating one rated at 50 cycles and another at 60 cycles, the best way of transferring power or the only way of transferring power is to have a DC link, convert uh, one side uh, and both sides from AC to DC and then connect them together. So you can transfer power through that uh, without the need for the two systems to operate at the same treatment.